So good afternoon. My name is Jürgen Michel uh, from MIT, and I'll be chairing the next session. And I know this is a session you've been waiting for, because finally you can get your hands dirty, so to speak. Uh, so this is uh, all about work groups, and uh, we have um, two keynote speakers for this uh, afternoon session. Um, uh, they're talking about system requirements and technology gaps for onboard optical uh, interconnection, uh, uh, and these are uh, Tom Maripode. Uh, he is the director of Advanced Interconnect Technology Development uh, for Molex Optical Solutions, and then Terry Smith, who is senior staff scientist uh, in the 3M Corporation Research Laboratories in St. Paul. So I don't know who is going first, but I know uh, you're kind of a tag team, so Terry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this, this presentation is meant to be sort of a warm up for the discussions that come next. This is, uh, I guess, the first application in interest group to come out of these discussions. So what I wanted to do is uh, talk a little bit about how this, this group was formed, um, things for you to keep in mind when uh, you're having the subsequent breakout discussions and then um, do a little recruiting for the next phases of, of this program. So where do I go? The clicker is not clicking. There we go. OK, so um, the topic of, of the talk is the board level optical interconnect. So, um, the idea is that uh, you want to transfer data optically uh, at high speed uh, across a blade, uh, across a backplane, and then from the blade of the backplane um, somewhere else in, your, um, in the vicinity. Um, the reason that people talk about doing that um, is driven by several factors. Uh, one is bandwidth density. Uh, High-speed copper tends to be relatively large. Uh, fiber optics can be small, so that um, by transferring the data optically, you can increase the, the data density, gigabits per square centimeter at the edge of the board, and therefore leave more room for uh, cooling air, et cetera. Um, also, there's lower signal crosstalk, crosstalk in optical than in copper. Uh, as you know, for distances around a data center, um, that's practically um, uh, uh, distance proof, I guess, is what I would say, um, compared to copper. In other, words, in other words, the signal impairments do not depend on the kinds of distances uh, in a data center in, in fiber optics, especially single mode fiber optics. And then um, there's also the potential for low power, dis lower power dissipation in optics because uh, you don't have the, um, the resistive and um, skin depth losses that occur in copper. Uh, so it's a great concept in principle, but there are lots of reasons why it hasn't happened on a wide scale. Um, first of all, the components are today more expensive than the equivalent copper. Uh, there's a lot of um, precision required in the connections. So for single mode fiber, where you have a 10, 10 micron core, uh, you need sort of one micron uh, alignment tolerances in order to make connections. Uh, there's a lot of labor involved in uh, assemblies, assembling the print circuit boards. Today, the, the modules plug in and the fibers plug into those, so somebody has to do that manually. Uh, it requires a uh, relatively high level of skill to not break things. Uh, there are long-term uh, concerns about reliability and maintenance, dirt on connectors, that sort of thing. Relatively high mating force in today's um, high fiber count connectors. Um, the overall cost benefit ratio when viewed as a complete ecosystem. So you introduce these high tech components with this high capacity, but then you have to upgrade your labor force to take care of those. Do you win or not? Um, of course, this potentially disrupts the, uh, the printed circuit board industry if you find a way to integrate optics onto that board. And um, there's an issue uh, in integrated optics on the board related to the fact that 
uh, polymers tend to have much higher absorption at the um, traditional single mode wavelengths than do um, inorganic materials, and so it's hard to integrate the waveguides with the boards. So this provides the motivation for looking at the um, system and saying, what can we do to find out whether or not um, optics at the board level can be practical? So in our breakout group, where we talked about board level optics, um, one of the issues that was identified was this, this issue related to connectors. So how do we make connectors that are suitable for these kinds of high density um, board applications that get around issues of cost, sensitivity to dirt, high precision that I mentioned before? So um, one way to do that uh, might be to use expanded beam connectors. Um, <clears throat> that means a connector where a fiber comes in and there's some kind of an optical element that expands the optical mode to much larger than the, um, the fiber mode, making at least the lateral alignment tolerances um, easier to obtain mechanically. So when um, uh, you look at this, you, um, uh, it, it can be at first very attractive. Uh, that is, we have these relaxed, uh, whoa, got way ahead. So we can get these relaxed uh, alignment tolerances at least laterally. We, uh, because of that large beam, if a particle of dirt obscures that beam, um, for a given size, there's much less effect in intensity, so it's more resistant to dirt. You can have lower mating force because you don't need um, physical contact. In conventional single mode connectors, normally what happens is the cores are, uh, the fibers are polished so they're domed and you push them together hard enough that they make um, optical contact, that interface goes away. And in order to do that, you need a lot of force. The more fibers you're connecting, the more force you need. And so going to a non-contact style connector, like an expanded beam connector, can really um, uh, make that easier to, to obtain. And finally, by relaxing the tolerances, relaxing the forces, et cetera, maybe we can uh, come up with lower cost um, systems. Okay, the problem with that is that um, today expanded beam connectors typically have higher loss. Um, and um, they, uh, although they relax the lateral alignment tolerances, by expanding the beam, you tighten the angular alignment, alignment tolerances. Now, those are normally easier to, uh, to hold, but um, it's something to, to keep in mind. And finally, um, the alignment of fiber to that expanding element is not relaxed. So somehow in your in, internal to your connector in the ferrule, you need a way to maintain that alignment. Okay, so based on these kinds of motivations, uh, the idea that came out of this um, technology working group that uh, John McWilliams and I participated in uh, several meetings ago was let's find out um, what the real issues are. Let's uh, build something and use that prototype to identify additional technical challenges that we might not have anticipated and see how well all this comes together. So that's what we did. We are now in the first phase of the program, which consists of um, applying expanded beam connectors um, uh, to the system. Um, but at this point, just expanded beam connectors. The next phases of the program, uh, where we're looking for more participants, are um, to use expanded beam connector interfaces at the module. And finally, um, in the third phase of the program, we'll look at uh, expanded beam interfaces to couple modules to embedded waveguides. So uh, uh, Tom Maripold will tell you about the experimental work that's been done to date in, in phase one of this program. Okay, so this, this program is uh, an INEMI program. It's aligned with the roadmaps that was, were developed in AIM um, and here in the Microphotonics Consortium. Uh, an important thing to remember is that this is based on um, the roadmap um, belief 
that it is single mode silicon photonics that will result in the most scalable approach for transceivers in the future. So we're not talking about multi-mode things here, we're talking about only single mode, and that has implications both in the tolerances and in the loss if you're going to uh, consider polymer waveguides for your embedded waveguides in, in a board. Um, so we're expecting um, the, the transceiver cost to come down by leveraging CMOS foundries, and um, however, in order to leverage that, even if the chips are lower cost, as you've heard people say, um, the cost of a module is largely determined by the cost of the, uh, the packaging, the optical coupling. Um, so reducing the cost of the chips by uh, leveraging the CMOS foundries in high volume doesn't help you much if the cost of the packaging doesn't change. So that's what we have to address. Okay, I think I've covered most of this. All right, so this is uh, what, uh, what Tom will tell you about in a moment. Um, experiments done to prove, um, prove the uh, utility of the connectors at the, the back plane and the front panel for array um, expanded beam connectors. And then um, I want to give you an introduction to the next couple of phases here. So um, the next phase, which we think will start in uh, sort of the early July time frame, is to take the expanded beam connector technology, which has been um, demonstrated in this first phase, and apply it to the interface of a module. So not fiber to fiber, but fiber to module. So given the complexity of this, we decided to do this in, um, in two steps. Uh, so there's a phase 2A and a phase uh, 2B. And these are going to be framed as uh, what INEMI calls quick turn projects, mean so we're talking about about a year for each of these phases. Um, so this is what um, we would get at the end of, of uh, phase uh, 2A and B. It would be some kind of demonstration module that has a silicon photonics chip, or it could be an indium phosphide pick, on a substrate with some kind of, of magic uh, chip to fiber attachment element and an expanded beam interface then the rest of the system would be um, similar to what has already been demonstrated. Uh, so the first phase of this program is really the planning phase, phase 2A. So uh, the goal is to identify the participants who want to uh, be involved, to reach agreement on what this demonstration system specification should be, and to model the system performance, finalize system design, et cetera, and finally complete a statement of work. Uh, in this case, um, for 2B, there will probably be some um, expenses related to building of tooling, et cetera, maybe for that coupling element, um, maybe for uh, the chips to use in the demonstration. In the case of phase one, it's all been in-kind funding. So no external funding came into the program. Uh, what happened was um, the participants all had components that they agreed to share to um, enable this, this demonstration. And we'd like to keep that as much as possible the same. So we'd like for the, the people who join up for the next two phases uh, to have most of what's needed for the demonstration. Uh, one of the principles that we used when we came up with this program initially was to um, go for what we called low-hanging fruit. So some situation where a lot of what was needed already existed among the participants so that we could do something relatively quickly that would be meaningful. Okay. So um, the deliverables for phase two a then would be, as I said before, basically the plan for, um, for phase 2B, where the real experimental work would begin. I won't subject you to this chart, uh, but basically this is the, uh, a layout of what the work would be for the first year um, of the program, as I said, beginning in July probably, um, and leading to uh, the completed 
uh, proposal for, for uh, phase 2B. For phase 2B, um, the goal is to actually um, build or source the components needed to build the, the board level interconnect demo with an expanded beam interface on the module. And that, as I said before, may require some new tooling for which we may need uh, some external funding. So part of phase uh, 2A is to identify uh, the source of that funding. And then the system will be built and tested. Um, so similar to phase uh, one, um, key metrics of the performance of the system will be measured, uh, loss, um, signal integrity, et cetera. Uh, so the deliverables will be then a, a um, basically an analysis of uh, the performance that can be achieved using expanding B interface on the on the module. Okay, come on there. Um, so in order to complete this um, phase two demo, we need uh, the following components. We need the expanded beam connectors, chassis, and flyover cable assemblies, uh, those things um, mostly exist now based on phase, uh, phase one. We also need um, the uh, expanded beam receptacle and connector for the module, some kind of a coupler for the chip. We need the chip itself, um, uh, an interface to the um, module, uh, to the board or interposer, uh, connector termination process, and um, uh, chip coupling uh, process. So those are the areas where we're really um, anxious to find people who would like to join up and contribute to the program. Okay, so uh, in phase one, uh, some of the key participants who, who plan to continue include uh, Molax, US Connect, and Senko, and Juniper that's doing the system testing, um, but we need uh, to fill out that complement with some of these other capabilities I just mentioned. Uh, all right, so to, to wrap up, the, uh, the timing of this thing looks like this. Um, we've held an uh, initial meeting to uh, talk about this to a, a wider audience um, at OFC. Uh, the next step um, to be done before May 30th is to um, recruit participants, get uh, input from them and um, uh, basically generate a proposal that can uh, go to INME for approval uh, with uh, a goal of approval by, uh, by June 15th. After that, uh, sign up in June and July and we hope, as I said before, we hope to start the actual project work in July. Okay, so that's what I have to say. So, thank you. So, Tom will now talk about the phase one experimental work. Thank you, sir. I'll use this side because you all are looking at that side. Uh, good to see you all again. Thank you for having me here again. Uh, I'm going to talk about the project that I've been chairing um, and uh, exciting for this point in time is that we get to report some data, which is always good for a project. We're making progress. Um, so as Terry explained, uh, what we envisioned at the beginning was to do some of the uh, early fundamental work on measuring single mode expanded beam connectors, which until this point did not exist in the marketplace. Uh, if you think back in time, you know, we've had a number of multi-mode, um, multi-fiber connectors, and then the lens version of that came um, probably five years ago, but the single mode version of that uh, has not been available. So that's a, a big step for the industry. And what we're doing here is, um, you know, getting a group of companies together that had uh, some, some common work going on, marrying those up with a, a group of participants um, in some common direction of a, of a multi-phase plan. So uh, we are looking to do something where um, we're, we're self-funding the project, we're providing some context to a technology to the industry to give you confidence that these things are going to work as the devices start to mature and they can be used in systems, do system level testing, and that just kind of helps the whole ecosystem move along uh, and understand uh, in a fairly early point in time uh, that these things are viable or not. 
you know, so, so uh, knowing what doesn't work is also uh, very important, right? Uh, you know, that, that, that knowledge up front that you can build some confidence in how these things work um, is uh, very beneficial to the overall community. Some of the work that uh, is important to system designers, obviously, is what is the link loss budget? Uh, how many connectors can we have in a system? Uh, what are the impairments that might be caused by an interconnect? Uh, since we're working in something that has not been done before, you know, there's a lot of questions in terms of uh, single mode uh, materials, the birefringence in these materials because they're molded, um, and what impairments they might have on a silica photonics link. Uh, as we get into some of the data, we'll talk about some things uh, such as, you know, how well isolated the lasers are in silicon photonics devices that they're insensitive to back reflection and other impairments. So, you know, a lot of good understanding will come from the data that we pre present uh, to the uh, user community. And then if we have time, which I don't think we will, uh, we hope to do some dust testing, some thermal testing uh, in some of the components so that we can build up a little bit more history. Uh, maybe we'll do that in, in a separate venue. Uh, because we're getting pretty close to the finishing time on the project. Uh, we have a really good working community. Uh, we've got connector manufacturers, uh, system vendors, uh, along with uh, facilitators who have helped us in framing the project and keeping us uh, moving along in the right directions. We meet uh, approximately every couple of weeks on conference calls. More recently, we've added uh, the Fraunhofer Institute uh, because they might be participating in phase two and phase three. So they're trying to get used to what the project is and the cadence that it runs at. Uh, but uh, overall, things have been working very well and uh, pretty much marking along, uh, marching along our planned timeline. So what we're trying to do here is um, you know, validate a single mode expanded beam element that works within interconnect that the uh, industry is, is familiar with. Obviously, front panel connectors, blind mating back panel connectors, uh, there's nothing novel there. Uh, those have been around for quite a long time. What we're changing is the element of interconnect inside of those. So within that connector frame, uh, we can install these single mode expanded beam connectors. We have two different types that we're testing and uh, allow the you know, system architects that are already familiar with these types of connectors to see that single mode works, but also to educate the wider community that might start using these in a broader application. Um, today, these types of connectors are mainly used in telecom applications, but as we kind of lower the cost and increase the flexibility and the capability of, of silicon photonics devices, we can start to put these into other industries that where they have not been used before because of cost. For instance, the server community has not really adopted an optical link down to the server level um, because they're just not quite ready for it. The, the capabilities of the system aren't there. And they also have different requirements. Uh, and that's really what's driving a single mode expanded beam connector is if we put these things into a server environment, that's a new class of user that's going to be using these types of connectors and they need to be more robust at the user level. Um, as Terry mentioned, you know, how we can clean them, keeping them dust insensitive. All of that changes as you go from the telecom environment down to the datacom environment and getting closer to the, closer to the server blade. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a graphical look of what we're doing. Um, uh, Terry first came up with these and that's easy to pop pictures in there, but I found as we went through the project, things get a little more complicated and I'll show you some of that, uh, some of that work the team discovered. Uh, on the US Connect side, we'll also be working with the MXC connector. That's just another version of connector uh, that is uh, also providing multi-function, uh, multi-fiber functionality, mainly for expanded beam. This has been released for multi-mode, uh, and now this early single mode work will get us in the, in the area of doing that type of testing with two different types of interconnects. And then that's where things got interesting. Um, so what we found as we started to work our way through the project is it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna do a front panel interconnect, a blind mating backplane connector, but then you have to look at, well, if I wanna do one mated pair, two mated pair, three mated pairs, we now have to keep track of the fiber count, right? We've got fiber one that has to mate to fiber one. We start to add different cable assemblies and you start to flip things. Um, we also found out that the test set uh, likes to have a certain distance between these elements so that it can discriminate them at the insertion loss and return loss level. So as you march through that, uh, you know, we all learned a little bit uh, about uh, how to construct these test beds and it never works the first time. So the first time that uh, uh, Valerie tried to put it together, 
Uh, I happened to be in California, had to come in and flip some things around because we had fiber polarities wrong. So uh, it never goes as, as well as you plan until you actually start doing the work. So it's been uh, uh, interesting for us all. At the test set level, uh, we're doing two different types of tests. We have an insertion loss, return loss test set, and then we also have a silicon photonics device. And uh, this gets us uh, two different types of data. Uh, the first set is something that we're going to get that's kind of industry standard, comes off of a test set. You can believe the numbers. Uh, you can get you know, good, valid data, both at an insertion loss and the return loss side of it, um, because you can't get return loss coming off of a silicon photonics device. Um, so this is good for us to get our, our baseline measurements and understand what the devices are really doing. And then when we go to the silicon photonics device, we also face some challenges. It has uh, combined transmit receives in the same output ribbon. So we had to make some jumpers that did some flips and flops for us to combine things together. Um, and uh, we also had to do some baseline. Uh, so as you'll see in the diagram here, to get ourselves a baseline, we just simply looped back the first access points. And that allowed uh, Valerie to tune up the uh, BERT test to where he got all the functions performing correctly and got himself running at 25 gig and then we open up that interface and insert the things that we want to test. This is a view of the chassis. Uh, Celestica provided us an ATCA chassis. This was nice because it gave us an open zone that we use for the optical connectors. And you can see a, a picture of the front side with the uh, uh, Molex and uh, US Connect connectors, and then a view towards the back side of the rack. This is pretty common in terms of telecom equipment. Uh, you're either going to be connecting off the front side of that rack or the blade uh, or uh, coming off the back side. Um, fairly easy to implement mechanically. No big challenges there. A little closer view towards the inside so you can see uh, how our cable assemblies are going to pass through the connector. And uh, normally you'd have your photonics devices if they're on card someplace in the area inside. Uh, one thing we found was that uh, we hope to do one, two, three, four, and five mated pairs. Uh, we found that uh, uh, doing two mated pairs and four mated pairs caused us too much problem in our fiber flips. So we paired back the testing to just doing uh, one, three, and five. Again, it was okay because at least we had uh, both, both ends of that spectrum to test. And for some test data. Uh, if you look at the top row, this is both the uh, data presented from the insertion loss test set and then also from the silicon photonics device. And in general, the data correlated pretty well. Uh, if you understand optical modules here, where you're not getting a true sense of insertion loss from an optical module. You're getting what it thinks it's transmitting for power, what it thinks it's receiving, and then you drive those through the GUI. Uh, but in general, everything lined up pretty well with the actual measurements of an insertion loss test set. So if you step through this, uh, we had pretty good performance. Uh, you know, one mated pairs of connectors around a half a dB. And then as you aggregate all those together, this is five mated pairs of connectors um, at somewhere around uh, three dB. So that data looks really good. And uh, I've got a little more granularity to that in the next couple of slides. But uh, very happy with the performance. And uh, this was the first set of uh, uh, data off the Molex connectors. And then the US Connect uh, interfaces are in, in, in test now. And then the Senco connectors will fall after that. And then at the return loss, uh, same, same thing. Uh, when we look at a single mated pair, we had return loss of around minus 35, 36 dB, uh, which was uh, really good. These are uh, AR coded interfaces. So if we were to take that AR coding off, obviously that number would degrade by a bit. And then as you aggregate, five mated pairs together, you know, you get around that 30 dB link margin. Um, this will be important uh, when you start to look at this across different silicon photonics devices. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the module that we used had a very good uh, isolated laser, so it's not going to be impacted in terms of its uh, bit error rate um, from any reflections in the link. But regardless, I think we had a good, a good baseline that we probably would have performed well even with a device that, that didn't have such good uh, isolation at the laser level. And then the next one gives you a little more data to look at in terms of uh, transmitted power, received power at the data from a zero, zeroing out point. 
uh, and then going through the first mated pairs of connectors. I have both the insertion loss uh, derived at the module and from the test set, and then looking at the return loss. So pretty consistent numbers all the way across, uh, really no surprises. And it worked uh, so well that um, you know we really did not get any bit error rate uh, impairments in the link. So uh, not a lot of exciting data to see. We would have hoped that going through two or three or four mated pairs of connectors, we'd start to see the eye close up or have some impairments. But again, uh, it's a pretty robust uh, system that we are testing with and uh, didn't, didn't really see any impairments at all. You know, so this is, this is pretty good from a system perspective, right? Because the more mated pairs you can have in a system, uh, the more it allows the system architect to design things that are more flexible. You can go through different types of configurations in the system. Uh, you can uh, increase the budget and include optical switches. So the more interconnects you can allow in a system, it just gives a wide open, um, you know, much more wide open operating parameters to the architects in terms of link loss budgets. Where we are in terms of the schedule, uh, we're just finishing up uh, the ins insertion loss and bit error rate testing on the uh, US Connect parts. And then we'll work on the Senco parts uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think we're targeted to have all of this done um, in time for getting our report and getting things issued in the May timeframe. So again, as Terry mentioned, this is about a one year program that we're doing uh, and we're on target to do that. Um, we hope to have some extra time that we could try to get some dust testing or some thermal testing done. We'll, we'll see how it all falls out in the end. Uh, but so far, everything's been going, uh, going really well, and it's uh, uh, been a pleasure working with the team members. So at the end of this, we'll be able to publish a set of data to the user community that single mode expanded beam connectors have a certain performance parameters. Their operation is not going to impair a, um, you know, an optical system that's running at least at 25 gig and uh, that gives them confidence that they can deploy these connectors uh, in an environment. And that also allows us to move to phase two and phase three uh, because we understand the parameters a little bit better. We know that we, you know, we don't have any things, uh, we're quite worried about birefringence in the materials when we first started for single mode because that can cause polarization sensitivity. Um, so it doesn't appear that we've got those types of problems and it gives us confidence that in phase two and phase three we can move forward and, and not have, and have those fundamental things already behind us. I think that's the last one. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tom and Terry, uh, for these insightful um, experiments. And I think that's kind of a guideline for something we want to do probably in other areas as well. So uh, if there are questions, uh, maybe we can take one or two questions or comments. Yes. So this is a single fiber to fiber or, or, or multiple sets. Is there any plans to do? MT type ferro. Yeah. So yeah. with eight, eight fibers. Is there any plans to do more statistics on, on, on fiber matings? To... Uh, yeah, so we, the insertion loss test set allowed us to collect data across uh, four different wavelengths. Um, geez, 1260, 1310, 1550, 1628. So we'll be able to get the uh, uh, wavelength sensitivity uh, for both the insertion loss and return loss. Um, we don't expect to see any problems with mate demate uh, for in terms of repeatability, but we can probably do that at least on, on one set of connectors. And I also forgot to mention um, the first two um, uh, connector samples that we're testing are both expanded beam lens type connectors. The Senco product is a expanded beam fiber to fiber connector uh, with uh, um, expanded core fiber. So that's a different type of technology, so that'll give us a different data point. Questions or comments? Uh, so, so John was asking, uh, these cables were assembled at each representative supplier's factories and then shipped to the Juniper Lab in, in California where uh, Valerie plugged it into the test sets and, and uh, did the testing. Right, so there's no termination? No, no. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, one more. Uh, it looks like this technology is not necessarily tied with the uh, silicon phenolic transceiver. If we interface transceiver, it's okay, right? Okay. Photonics. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom, again.